In the 1970s, a dark secret was tucked away in local record shops. Deep in the dusty basements, among cobwebs and forgotten dollar vinyls, was a wave of albums that stole from hundreds of unsuspecting artists. LPs by nameless creators, somehow worth thousands a copy, while remaining invisible to the public. What or who was behind this shady phenomenon? Well, let's take a closer look and investigate scam records and the artists they stole from. Moving to Los Angeles, Richard Goldman began recording an EP in a series of reputable studios around the city. In this time, Goldman recorded next door to Fleetwood Mac. Him and guitarist Lindsey Buckingham would compete at a pinball machine between studios. One night, Lindsey recorded a bass part in one of Richard's songs, Sinatra's Car. Lindsey offered to help. He was indeed flawless, did it in one take. While recording his demo, Goldman even had psychedelic funk legend George Clinton play on a couple of tracks. When it came time to shop around his demo, Richard had one Hail Mary in his pocket. His girlfriend temped at a law office and she gave it to a new music producer client. They never heard back until years later in 1980 when one of Goldman's friends was shopping and randomly bought an album based on the cover art. They immediately recognized Goldman on vocals. Upon playing the track for Richard on the phone, he remarked, what the hell do you have there? Well, New York label Baby Grand Records released Richard's LP for him, except they didn't credit Richard at all and in a cruel irony, titled the album Almost Famous. This type of shady practice was actually happening across the country. is Stonewall. Stonewall was a young New York band that just finished their first EP and sent it everywhere looking for a record deal. Similar to Goldman, they didn't land a contract and shortly after disbanded, leaving the record in purgatory. That is, until one of the members received a call from a European collector. Turns out their album was secretly released through a record label called Tiger Lily. Unlike Almost Famous, Tiger Lily kept the original Stonewall name. The most peculiar part though, is there were only five copies ever found. The record was given an extremely limited release and had no promotion. So why steal and release an album with seemingly no plan to actually profit from it? Well, a closer look into Tiger Lily reveals them to be a subsidiary label, the child of highly successful Roulette Records. Roulette signed artists like Count Basie, Sammy Davis Jr., and Louis Armstrong. At the helm of both operations was the man Morris Levy, an industry insider who also owned the Birdland Jazz Club in New York. Morris had ties to the mafia, but we'll get back to that. Even though record labels throughout the country were pulling the scam, many could be traced back to Tiger Lily in one way or another. Jim Armstrong was approached by Tiger Lily and willingly signed over an album recorded by his then defunct band, The Spiders. Armstrong met with Morris Levy, where he was paid and given some physical copies of the album. Levy reportedly said, don't expect any more money or royalties. Sound of the City Experience also signed over their record to Tiger Lily. They figured it would secure future work, 
operating as a key to unopened doors. Nobody in the band actually spoke with the label. They had not even heard of Morris Levy until decades later. John Scoggins was met with a similar offer as the others. After receiving no promotion, he took matters into his own hands. Scoggins paid for ads in rock magazines, got songs on the radio, and was receiving favorable reviews. But just like the others, with zero support from Tiger Lily, his career didn't go much further. This was truly a whirlwind of theft. We still may not know the sheer scale of these operations, but people were catching on. Richard Goldman, for example, took matters into his own hands when he discovered Almost Famous. Goldman reached out to the LA Times. What followed was an expose article that blew the lid off this illegal practice happening across the country. Here's the scam they uncovered. Successful larger labels created a ghost label, a subsidiary designed to fail. Then they found music, whether through stealing a male demo or making shady deals. They created fake names, threw some artwork together, and boom, it was ready for release. They pressed just enough vinyls to make it look legitimate. The vinyls were directly sent to landfills, warehouses, or just immediately destroyed. While this process wasn't particularly expensive, the labels claimed it cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. Come tax season, the projects would be written off as a failed venture, allowing them and any financiers to claim gigantic losses on their taxes. Losses that were stacked up against the profits of their booming parent companies. By the 1980s, these labels were pretty much extinct. Laws were put into place that made it much more difficult to overvalue records. And so this era came to an end, leaving behind it a trail of stolen art. Soon after, Morris Levy was arrested at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, along with members of the Genovese crime family. Levy was accused of extortion and using the roulette room as a front for the mafia. He sold roulette and tiger lily to Rhino Records, but died two months before going to prison. Through a certain lens, you can argue that the association with tax scam labels has helped to immortalize some of these albums. In the case of Richard Goldman, after the LA Times article was published, his music had a light resurgence. Lisa Hartman would go on to record a cover of his song, Johnny Always On My Mind. For the first time in his career, Goldman was earning royalties on his songs. In some way, I am thrilled this stuff is preserved in the musical amber of a tax shelter record. Although the tax scam labels are long gone, the mystery surrounding this 1970s trend persists. Collectors still search record stores for these pieces of history. There are also those who speculate that somewhere, in some warehouse, lies a collection of discarded gems just waiting to be found. Thank you all for watching. If you love the video, make sure you're subscribed. If you want to support the channel more, feel free to drop a super thanks donation. That goes towards making future videos even better. I also want to give a special shout out to the folks at Dangerous Minds who have a series of articles deep diving into this era. Links to those, along with all of my other citations, are in the description.